So with Hashem's loving grace, we learned tonight, our lesson is entitled, The Vanished Nations, Psalm 10, 11, 12, and 13. And so with each psalm, we try to give a little introduction and give a context and what King David was saying, like how King David was praying, and what it means. Okay, we'll try and make it so it's very meaningful for us. And you can see when you say these psalms and know what you're saying, you'll see your own life. I guarantee you, you'll see your own life. Because as we said in our very first introductory lesson, King David, as King of Israel and as Mashiach, he had the all-inclusive soul and he suffered so much. He had the all-inclusive suffering. There is not a single bit of suffering that uh, one of us suffered that King David didn't suffer. Uh, at one of our cherished members in, in, in our group uh, wrote me a letter this week that had a, a, a difficulty and a uh, social problem that the group of, of friends and all of a sudden he was treating them like an outcast. And I answered that the, our, our cherished friend that they don't deserve to have that person as a friend because the people in this group are just so wonderfully wonderful. This happened to King David. Just what happened, this letter this letter, I could take this letter that I, I got from our group member and put it right in Psalms. It's, in fact, it's going to be in the Psalms right tonight. This is so timely. And our group member, when she sees this, uh, she'll see herself in these Psalms. And you, this is encouraging that this is Hashem right there with her, right there with her. This is Epemuna. Epemuna, you have your father in heaven right there with you. And this week was difficult, difficult, uh, we had difficult between the, the missile attacks and the casualties and every, every single one. And one day I was really about to crash, about to crash. And all of a sudden in this difficulty, I saw something that was just so unnatural. And it's a sign, my son, I'm right there with you. We open up our eyes and we see Hashem and he's right there with us. But to see it, we have to open up our eyes. And opening up our eyes means opening up our spiritual eyes. Like you say, you say to the steer, get your face out of the food trough. Okay. Get out of the feed trough. You know, it's not, it's not about the hay and the grain. Look at your soul. Look at the soul. And this is what we're doing. Okay. So let's start with Psalm 10. Psalm 10. Wow. Psalm 10 is a prayer for the victims of tyranny. You know, people, you have got a nasty boss, you're a victim of tyranny. You have a nasty neighbor, you're a victim of tyranny. Sometimes a person has an abusive family member, a victim of tyranny. You can't just go around shooting people and, and beating people up. And people that are close to Hashem, they don't want to take revenge. They don't want to retaliate. They Sometimes it's difficult to know how to protect yourself, where protecting yourself leaves off and where retaliation and revenge begins. Okay, protecting yourself, we're certainly allowed to do that. Because uh, the Torah says, if someone arises to do you damage, to kill you, you have to protect yourself. And But you're not allowed to take revenge, and we're not allowed to, the Shem, revenge is a, is a Shem, that's for a Shem. Okay, so you'll see, look, look what King David said. King David, he's got enemies from within, he's got enemies from without, his own family, his father-in-law's chasing him to kill him, his closest advisors, two sons, not one son, two sons revolted against him. He's got officers that, that are, are loyal with the, with the revolutionaries and not to him. And King David just doesn't know where to go. He doesn't know where to go. King David seemingly does not have a friend on earth. So King David says in Psalm 10, listen to King David talking. This is every one of us. And when you're saying it, let yourself cry. Don't be, don't be embarrassed. Let yourself cry. Go cry. Let the tears flow. Okay, because they're tears of pain. They're not tears of complaint. There's a big difference between tears of pain and tears of complaint. When you say Psalm, let the tears fly. The Midrash tells us that Hashem has a cup of tears. And when that cup fills up, he's going to bring us Mashiach and build us a holy temple. Okay, so cry. But this is not cry tears of complaint. Hashem, why are you doing this to me? This is Hashem. I heard all over. So King David, imagine King David crying. King David says in Psalm, in, in Psalm 10, Lama Hashem tamod b'rachok talim litol b'tzarah. Hashem, why do you stand afar and ignore the times of distress? And Hashem, of course, knows exactly what's going on. 
But King David is saying to him, it seems that you, you, you're ignoring me. King David knows in his heart that Shem's not ignoring me, but he doesn't hear from Hashem. He calls Hashem. Shem doesn't hear, doesn't hear from him. Then he says in the second passage, In his arrogance, the evil person hunts down the poor who are ensnared in the schemes that the evil connive. That person that's trying to steal your money or trying to steal your position or that's vying with you for who's going to get the promotion and he's talking behind your back and a person's conniving or he's a business competitor or someone that the family they ask someone that uh about your son and your daughter to, 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 for for a, re a reference to make it a, a match and, and then they say something bad you see people plotting against you and you feel powerless he said, why do all these evil people have all this power? And then I'm powerless. King David says, what, they all go against the Shem? He says, the evil person prays himself for attaining what he wants. Uh, he said, look, look at you. You're a down and outer. I get what I want. And the robber lauds himself for angering Hashem. The robber takes pride that he gets on Hashem's nerves. He takes pride. He says, oh, I'm going to do what I want. If you take all the tyrants in the world, Nimrod, he prided himself for revolting Hashem. All the, all, all the tyrants in the world, they pride themselves for revolting Hashem. And P Pharaoh says, who's Hashem that I should listen to him? Uh, they all they ride a big horse and then it comes down. They, have a, they go really high. But you know, that's Newton. The higher they go, the more they crash land. If you fall, a person that's a, that is modest, he, he keeps this a person humble. His nose is close to the ground. <laughs> How can he fall? He falls 12 inches, 24 inches. But the arrogant person that's flying at Mach 10 in the stratosphere when he crashes, ooh, it's smithereens. So now King David says in verse 4, that because of his arrogance, the evil person will never seek Hashem. All of his sinister thoughts are that there's no God. Look, nobody's stopping me what I want. I do what I want when I want. There's no God. This is what the sin the evil person says. <laughs> Who is he making a big mistake? And he's up for a big, rude awakening. But this way, see, but the, the, Hashem gives him the rope to hang himself. So why does Hashem do this? Hashem gives a free choice. So now he gives that evil person free choice because now all the venom comes out. All the venom comes out. Maybe it was in his heart. Some people walk around the heart. The arrogant person, it comes out. And now he's so arrogant. He says, like Pharaoh, who's Hashem that I should listen to him? I do what I want. I give the orders. Okay, this is the evil person talking. Verse 5. He succeeds every time. King David's talking to Hashem. Hashem, every time that your justice regards him, every time you don't throw the book at him. Hashem, you know, the reason he succeeds is because you don't hold him responsible for what he's doing. Okay, this is what Shem, King David says when he says, your justice disregards him. It means you don't throw a book at him, Hashem. Okay. Uh, he repels his enemies with a puff of his mouth. He thinks that he's so strong that he could, he could puff, puff and, and his enemies fall away. Shem's letting that happen. Once again, don't be fooled. And for the meanwhile, Hashem is giving it the evil person, the rope that he's going to hang himself. Then he says in verse 6, <laughs> Look at this guy's arrogance. He says, the evil one tells himself he'll never stumble and he'll never encounter adversity. And he's the big man on the campus. It's like the big heavyweight champion, the bravado. Uh, what's it? Cassius Clay that became Muhammad Ali. You say, Muhammad Ali, I sting like a butterfly. I sting like a, oh, fly like a butterfly, sting like a bee. And then comes along some George Fraser, somebody that knocks him clean out. Never realize, the tyrants don't realize that somebody comes along stronger. Uh, King Solomon says, Lo leolam chosen, that you're not uh, invincible forever. Not ever. The time is coming. That, you know, it comes and where the, where the referee blows the whistle, whoop, and the game is over and it's judgment day. This is what the evil forget. Okay, so now we're up to uh, verse 7. Verse 7, he says, Ele piu male umilmot v'toch tachat l'shono amal v'oven. Look at King David's play-to-play -play description of the wicked. He swears falsely. He swears falsely. Oh, yeah. He swears this and he swears that. It's all lies. And his mouth is full of deception. He can't tell the truth if he wants to tell the truth. 
and his tongue harbors iniquity and lies. His tongue is so contaminated. These people are so contaminated. What did Chofetz Chaim, of all, he knew the whole Torah. The Chofetz Chaim concentrated on the laws of speech. Because if you want to be a righteous person, you have to have upright speech. So he could see these tyrants and these arrogant people and these bullies throughout history. And you see them in your day-to-day -day life. Don't be jealous of them. Okay, if they look like they're riding high and they look like they got a lot of power, it means that Hashem is giving them the rope to hang themselves. Hashem is letting them commit sins. Okay, and it's all being recorded. Okay, say whatever you want. You're not being recorded. Say whatever you want. Do whatever you want. Oh, succeed. Hashem gives them success. You know what Hashem is doing? The uh, casino masters in, in Las Vegas, they learn from Hashem. Somebody comes in there and they let them win. They will them with ten thousand uh, dollars, and then they win fifty thousand dollars, and let them win a hundred thousand dollars. They see the guy keeps playing. Now they let him win a half a million dollars. The guy keeps playing. Whoa! And now he starts losing, and he loses. He came in. He's not going to lose five hundred thousand dollars. What he won, he's going to lose two million dollars and three million dollars, and he's going to mortgage his business and mortgage bank and lose his bank. Do everything with these guys. This is Shem doing the same thing to an evil person. Hashem is letting them, okay, buddy, come on in. Come on to the casino. Roll your dice. Win. You can win. You're winning by doing illegal stuff. You're winning by gambling. Oh, but then Hashem throws the book at him. Then you'll see it all turns around. Okay, so we're now in the verse 8. What is the, King David is continuing a play-by-play -play description of the evil person. And this is the same person where you can see at work, where you can see in your neighborhood, where you can see in your family, where you can see in your community. Okay. Yashev b'marav chatserim b'mistarim yarog naki enav lechelcha yitzponu. He lies in the nook of ambush to kill the innocent in concealed places and he spies on the destitute. This is just the way Hamas does warfare. Okay. They fire a missile, then they go underground. And they look for them. They're underground. If an Israeli soldier is coming by and all of a sudden they pop out from underground and, and fire something else and pop in and they're just like rats. And this is the same way that, that and, but they won't come up. They, they know somebody come up and confront you and come up and, and confront you. But no, they won't do that behind your back and underground and this and that. They're so nasty and so evil. And they look at, look, ambush and ambush. No, they won't. They, come on, come on in the ring. Okay, you got a problem with me? Come, state your problem. They No, they won't do that. They won't do that. Or they say, say they want to uh, make somebody into an outcast or a pariah. They won't say, and listen, you know, we've got a problem with you. They're A, B, and C, this and that. No, they do. They don't have a problem. They got a problem with themselves. And so they'll go and they'll push the person away. And it's just nastiness and it's underhanded and it's not true. And like I told this person, I said, this Hashem is doing you a favor because you've been with these people. Hashem doesn't want you to be with these people. Okay, so Hashem is now showing the evil side so that you'll be pushed away. This is great. This is great. Can you imagine if you encountered uh, cancer cells, heaven forbid, and they say, no, we don't like you. They push you away. We don't like you. Thank you. You don't like me. Thank you that you're not becoming and, and, and embedded in my flesh. Some people are cancerous. They're, they're toxic. They're not good for you. And so when we don't have enough sense to get away from themselves, Hashem saves us. Okay, King David will realize this, but meanwhile, it hurts. So he talks about, he continues talking about this underhanded, wicked person. And in verse 9, he says like this, he says, Like a lion, he lurks in ambush from his hiding place. He prowls to see the poor person, then drags him in the net. This little lion, looks like he's, got, he's got teeth. And he's got fangs, and he and the poor person is defenseless because not used to a, a good person. What's he used to fighting against evil tongues and evil people? He's doing good things in the world. He doesn't, he doesn't even know how to how to fight that evil. He knows only how to do good. Okay, so what he takes it. So these the wicked people consider this as weakness. Okay, but King David will say later. We'll learn later. Anavim Yoshu Aretz. Uh, the nations translate this. I don't like to translate. They say the meek shall inherit the earth. Uh -uh, it's the humble shall inherit the earth. It's not the meek shall inherit. It's the humble shall inherit the earth. It's the wrong word. Like I say, that's why we're doing the proper translation, exactly what King David meant. 
Okay, so this humble person, uh, don't worry, you're suffering now. You know what the Gemara says? The Gemara says there's a road that the beginning is rocky and the end is smooth. And then there's a road, this is the path of the evil. The beginning is smooth and then the end is really rocky, really rocky. Uh, when Fashem gives us tribulations, that means we're on the rocky road in the beginning, but then the tribulations, they've got a designated time. Tribulations are limited in time. They're limited in shelf life. The Gemara tells us in Tractate Brachot that comes the time when they're over. Shem says, leave. That's it. You must leave this person right now. Okay, so tribulations, they are limited. If you don't worry about your tribulations, they're going to end. But your good lasts forever. This is the great news. So continuing on, this, this evil person who lies in ambush and acts like a lion, in verse 10, King David says, Yidke Yeshua He lowers himself, he crouches down, then pounces with his might on the unfortunate. Talking about the good people, the King David's called the poor and unfortunate, but this is short term. This is short term. The same, the success of the evil person is also short term. So what does the evil person tell himself? Now he succeeds. Oh, he's got a nice fat deer, that lion. And he says to himself, Kuma Hashem. Oh, he says, Amar Balibo, Shachach el Stir Panav Balra Ala Netzach. This is what the nasty person says to himself. He tells himself, God has forgotten. He has hid his countenance and he will never see. The arrogant person thinks that Hashem, heaven forbid, is blind. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. Not NASA and not all the CIA and MI5 and the KGB and all their spy satellites do not have the surveillance equipment that the Almighty has. He sees everything, knows everything. So this even the arrogance, the arrogance of this criminal calling Hashem blind, oh, you are in big trouble. Uh, Mr. Arrogant Tyrant, you are in big trouble. And the ax will come down on him. Don't worry. Okay. So now King David says, King David says, I want to see that ax come down on him. So in verse 12, he says like this, Arise, Hashem, lift your hand, do not forget the humble. And in verse 13, he says like this, this is now King David talking. He's not describing the, the, the wicked person anymore. This is King David coming back. King David has this prayer. This is the comeback. And this is the prayer that is going to trigger the salvation. Hashem, what is he basing himself off? Why does the wicked person ang anger God? He tells himself that you don't pay attention to what he does. Hashem, you, we both know that that's not true. But this is what the wicked person says, that you're not paying attention, that you're blind, you're an old man, and you don't see. That Hashem's not an old man, and Hashem sees. Don't worry about it. Ah, but now King David, in the, the final verse, in, in 14 here, he says, no, this is not the final verse, but verse 14. And verse 14, but you do see what he does. King David's now encouraging himself. He's coming back. He's been knocked down on the boards, but now he's getting back up fighting. And he, he doesn't stay down. Yeah, you get knocked down. But his son, King Solomon, tells us in Proverbs that a tzaddik gets knocked down seven times. You're not a tzaddik if you haven't been knocked down seven times. But he gets back up. And in the end, it's the referee that raises the tzaddik hand because he's in the victor's victor circle. That the, the evil person is going to be out by a knockout. King David says in verse 14, but you do see what he does. You do observe criminal and anger-provoking acts. Everything is in your power, Hashem. Let the downtrodden depend on you. You have always helped the orphan. Now King David says, okay, let me see. Let me think back what Hashem has, has, has neglected an orphan. Never. He's, King David is now saying, wait a second. Why am I doubting Hashem? He never neglected an orphan. Now King David is going on the offensive. In verse 15, look how he writes a war. Yeah, he takes a rolls with the punch, but now he's going on the offensive. In verse 15, Hashem, break the power of the wicked person. Punish him for his evil until no more is found. In other words, pulverize the evil until there's no more evil in the world. Okay, pulverize him. And then, Hashem, then King David says in verse 16, Hashem, melech olav va'ed, avdu goyim me'altso. 
And this is this is the title of our our our, our lesson tonight. Hashem is king forever and ever. The nations vanished from his land. What do you mean the nations vanished from his land? At different times through history, Israel was conquered by the Greeks. They're out. Israel was conquered by the Romans. The Romans, they pursued us so bad. Even before the Greeks was Babylonians. Okay. They're out. They're gone. No more, no, no more Babylonians. Okay. Iraq is not Babylonia. No more Babylonians. No more Nebuchadnezzar. And the Greeks, and the, the Greeks in, in Athens today are not the Greeks of uh, back then, the Macedonians and the Spartans, no more. And not the Seleucid Greeks, no more. The Romans, the Italians in Rome are not the Romans of Rome back then. No, different nation. They're no more. They no more exist. One by one, one by one, who have we not, has not occupied the Ottoman Empire in Turkey and of late? And even after that, we suffered, excuse me, my beloved friends in the UK, but uh, we had a rough time with the, with the British government here. The British government, uh, they hung a lot of Jews. They killed a lot of Jews. We had a rough time with the British, British government. Okay, but uh, they're all, Hashem kicks them out of the land. You have no right to be in my land. You know what this land is? This land is Hashem's palace. So you know who has a right to be in Hashem's palace? The two types of people that be right in Shem's palace. It's the Jews and the righteous Gentiles. The Torah calls the righteous Gentiles Gel Toshav. That they are because they they accept the mitzvah, they believe in Hashem. Okay, these are two types of people that be there. Other than that, we talk about the nations. We talk about the nations. We talk about the nations that don't believe in the Torah, nations that don't believe in Hashem, the nations that don't listen to Hashem, the nation where everything we have today with the, the political correctness is, has nothing to do with Torah, and it's on most, most sides against Torah. So King David continues on in his assault. King David is now on an assault. In verse 17, he says, Tavat anavim shamata Hashem, tachin libam necha. You have heard the wish of the meek, Hashem. Okay, Hashem, you've heard them crying. All right. Strengthen their hearts in prayer and listen to them. Okay, their hearts are broken. So Hashem, strengthen them. Strengthen their hearts in prayer. And with hearts of prayer, give them the encouragement. Don't let them be down. Hashem, give them the feeling in the heart that you hear them, that you're with them. And then they'll pray with fervor, with fervor and then you'll hear them. Uh-oh, that's, oh, wow. When when the, the unfortunate, the downtrodden, the meek, the humble, and they pray from the heart, forget about it. Forget about it. That's more dangerous than atomic weapon. And that will put a hydrogen bomb on the head of the evil person. And then verse 18, Lishpot Yetim Vadam by Yosif Od Larotz Enosh Mina Aretz. Hashem, you judge the orphan and the oppressed person. May there be no more tyranny against a single human on earth. That's it. King David's war against tyranny. Wow. I can take a deep breath after that. After saying that psalm and explaining it, I just feel like I ran a quick two miles. Okay, Bo Hashem, Bo Hashem. Now, instead of waiting to the end, I have to make a blessing right now. Okay, Bo Chato Adinoy Malacholam Shakol Niyavivoy. Thank you, Hashem. Thank you, Hashem, for the water. Thank you, Hashem, for our wonderful group. Thank you, Hashem, for King David. Thank you, Hashem, for the Psalms. And I think anybody that's been down, now you're not down anymore. You're up because Hashem's listening to you. Yeah, yeah. Let me see that smile again, big time. Show it again. Good. Good, Bo Hashem. So you could see how timely it was. And are there certain people tonight that you know this tonight's lesson? I'm just the mailman. This is Hashem's love letter to you. It's a straight love letter. We got now to Psalm 11. Okay, Psalm 11, the background to Psalm 11, you can find in Samuel 1, chapter 26. If you read Samuel 1, chapter 26, you'll find the background to why King David was just spilling his heart like this in, in, in Psalm 11. Because uh, King David writes in Psalm 11 about Hashem's loathing of the wicked and his love for the righteous. And Hashem says it looks like so much times in the world. Again, this is something we could all identify with. Why does it look like that the evil people are having such a great time and they're driving Mercedes and they, they're making a lot of money and... Uh, they, they look like they're they they look like they're riding their high horse and and the good people, the righteous people, 
the people with the Muna, they're having such a difficult life. It says, hold it, hold it. This is the world of lies. This is why, why is the, the world in Hebrew is called olam. Olam comes from the word ne'elam, which concealment. This word of concealment. If Hashem would conceal himself right there and uh, he'd say, hi, Eric John, I'm in Louisiana. Come on, it's missing me. Uh, oh, no, then Eric, Eric John wouldn't need a muna. And if it, Hashem would, would say, hi, Ivy Guy, I came to visit Florida. I came to, to, to bask in the, in the sun. Uh, no. <laughs> Hashem is right there with me. Hey, Yosef, don't worry about the Manchester winter. Here's the Shem. I'm right here. Okay. Yeah. But don't need a Muna. Shem conceals himself because you have to work for a Muna, work for a Muna. Now, how does this work? Rebbe Nachman explains this concealment. Rebbe Nachman explains that a Shem teaches us a Muna just like a parent teaches a baby to walk. When a baby first starts to walk, if the baby's on your arms all day long, you're not going to learn to walk. If Hashem holds us in his arms all day long, we're not going to learn a muna because Hashem is right there. What does it do? Hashem, like a baby, puts us on the ground, on the floor in this world, and we got to walk. And we take a step and a wobbly step, and it's not easy because the world is shaky. And Hashem steps away. He says, Hashem, I need you. And we take another step toward him. Like the baby, mommy, daddy, what's he moving away? So a little one and a half year old, he takes another step. But he won't learn to walk if mommy and daddy don't move back. They've got to move back. And then the baby yearns for them. This is what Hashem does to us. This is Hashem's concealment. It's all a product of love. He's moving away so that we'll seek him more. Hashem's right there with us and everything is fat city. And we got all the best health. And we're the most popular people on the block. And we're doing great business. And everything is wonderful. person that gets arrogant, Torah says that. Torah says when a person gets fat city, he kicks. Vayishman Yeshu and Vayiva. That's not a good thing. So Shem doesn't want to be like that because the Arab person can't be close to Hashem. So as Hashem does, he moves back to bring us close to him. Okay, Psalm 11. And this is Hashem. Uh, this is uh, Hashem's loathing of the wicked, how much he loves the righteous. When you think Hashem's not with you, listen to this. King David says, Lam not David, Bashem chasisi ech nafshi nudi alchem sipor. Uh, this is one of the Psalms where King David prepares this for the conductor in the Holy Temple. He says, you're going to sing this. This is a song. This is going to sing this. King David's a song by David. I have taken refuge in Hashem. So he says to the evil people, how can you tell me to flee from the mountain like a bird? We're talking about the mountain is the Mount Zion, the Holy Temple, that's where Hashem's presence. And they're, they're evil, chase, chase him away. You're telling me that I got to flee from the Holy Mountain like a bird? That, that this is that? No. no. And then he says, then he says in verse 2, Ooh, look how the wicked draw their bow and preparing their arrows on the bowstring in the dark to shoot at the upright of heart. Now, not in broad daylight. Again, this is the theme of King David, the great warrior. He sees how his enemy, how the evil do war. They, 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 they shoot. They shoot arrows at night. At night, they're not light. Nobody could see. All of a sudden, a person gets pierced, heaven forbid, in the heart and in the middle of the night. What's King David talking about? He's alluding to their tongues. Their tongues are like bowstrings. And the words that come off those nasty bowstrings are, are arrows that pierce the, the good people's hearts, that the humble people's hearts. This is King David's uh, metaphor. This is his imagery. And then in verse 3, he says like this, uh, He says, Hashem, if the, food, if the foundations are destroyed, what have the righteous done wrong? In other words, who are the foundations? The foundations are the righteous people of the world. The foundations are the righteous people. The world stands on the righteous people of the world. Okay, it's the world, but this would give people don't realize, but were it not for the righteous people of the world, there would be a, a, another flood and that's something different it, and it, the Noah, Noah kept going but if there a few, a few more Noahs they said these are the Noahs of the world the, the, the Abraham, Isaacs and eight, Jacobs of the world this is the this is the continuance of the world now if the world that despises us so much would realize that their lives in Toronto and in Los Angeles and in Miami and in Leeds and in Joburg and in Pretoria 
uh, wherever, wherever. It depends on some little tzaddik learning Torah in Me'asharim in Jerusalem. The same one that they're talking against. Wow. But this is going to be, this is going to be, it's going to be a really surprising outcome at the end. Like I say, at the end of the game, people are going to be surprised. People are going to be surprised. And uh, this is not my words, the words of the Gomorrah. Okay, so King David now continues on in verse 4. And he says, Hashem beichal kodsho, Hashem b'shemayim kiso, enav yechazu afafav yifchanu b'nei adam. Don't misunderstand Hashem, says King David. Even though Hashem is in his holy abode, the, 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 above whatever we can imagine, the heavenly throne, Heavenly throne, the highest, 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 highest. We're talking about heavenly throne. Now, when we learn some concepts in Kabbalah and we learn the Keter, Keter is the, the crown, that, that up in the heavenly throne, this is beyond anything we could fathom. Hashem is so far up, but hold it. Hashem is a basketball player. Hashem's got a pivot foot everywhere in the world. Okay, Hashem may be way up there, but Hashem has a pivot foot right down here. Okay, so he says, his throne is in heaven, but his eyes scrutinize all of humanity. Hashem has a very high-powered vision. Okay, and if Hashem's feet, Hashem has an infinite, he has no body. I'm talking about what did our, our third prince of Amunah. We know Hashem has no bodily properties. I'm speaking in metaphors, but this is because we're human. This is what we understand. But Hashem is everywhere, and his eyes are everywhere, and he sees everything. So don't think, Mr. Evil Person, because Hashem is apparently so far away, he's so close. As far away as Hashem is, that's how close he is. That's an important principle of Amuna. As far as he is, it's the approach avoidance, they, they say in psychology. As far away as Hashem apparently is, that's how close he is. He's right there with us. And then we continue on to verse 5. And King David, here's the, here's the score. Hashem tzaddik yivchan v'rashav ohev hamas sana nafsho. We said, you say, I'm a good person. Why is my life so difficult? King David gives you your answer right here in verse 5. Hashem tests the righteous. He tests the righteous. What's that? I'm going to say, you see, you test. Let's see if your Muna is real Muna. Let's see if your Bitochan, your trust in his real Bitochan. So Hashem gives, gives us a diagnostic test that we could test ourselves. Oh, wait a second. I got to strengthen myself in a Muna here. I had a, 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 a Time here with this week happened to me where I thought I had a Muna and the tribulation continued on and it got stronger, then it got stronger, then it got stronger, then it got stronger. And when it got stronger for about the sixth time, well, I felt the jitters. Oh, laser. Uh-uh. What is this sixth time? You where do you Muna? Okay, so Shem was push, push, put up, turn up the fire, turn up the fire. When well, they say they put the frog in, in, the, in the water on the fire, and they turn up the fire till the frog jumps out. It's too hot in here. Okay, so it came time where laser jumped out of the pot. Uh-uh, why uh, you jump out of the pot? Wait, well, you can't stand the fire. Strengthen your muna. This is telling myself, strengthen your muna. And I had to do true for the whole next day for not having strong enough a muna. Now we get back. Okay, so this is, is, is this a punishment? No, it's good. Because maybe if I wouldn't have had the tribulation, I thought, oh, hunky-dory, I'm the big man on the campus. Big man, no, Shepsi, you're not the big man on the campus. you got to strengthen the moon every day like everybody else. You know, better than anybody else. And you go and you want to walk the walk. You, you talk the talk. you got to walk the walk. Let's go. Come on. Let's go. I'm not going to tolerate. I'm going to they, they tolerate uh, that you fool yourself. Shem, loving father in heaven, just like a coach, just like a commander. Talks to you, coach and commander, do not talk to you nicely. Oh, will you please do this? No, it's you get barked, the commands barked at you, whether you're an athlete, whether you're a soldier. Shem is the same thing, but it's a loving father. That loving father, that coach wants his athlete to be first place, to be on the, on the, on the champion's podium. And the soldier, the commander, commander's worst nightmare is when a soldier doesn't come home. And he's got to knock on the door of the parents. Ah, worst nightmare. Worst nightmare. No. Okay. I'm not going to let that happen. So I'm going to kick your elbow so that doesn't happen. Okay. And we'd be tough on you. And we're going to do maneuvers. They do over and over again, over and over again. This is what Shem does. Shem does. Shem is such a loving father. And this is tough love, but it's love. Much rather have tough love than uh, hateful chocolate ice cream. Okay, they have all the chocolate ice cream you want. Well, you don't care about my health. You don't care about my teeth. You don't care if I get fat. 
That's not a, a gift to give me chocolate ice cream. No, 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 slap me on the face and tell me to eat a salad. <laughs> oh, we, okay, that, that's it. Bo Hashem. This Hashem is a loving father. And this is what he's telling us right here in this, right here in verse five. Hashem tests the righteous. Okay, now look what that second part of verse five says. But loathes the wicked and the lover of violence. Oh yeah, Hashem is testing you because you're righteous. And he loves, he tests the righteous. Let's say Hashem loves the righteous. But the, the, the juxtaposition of that is his loathe of the wicked. So here, if that's the opposite, and we have a parallel structure of what King David is doing, it means that his test of the righteous is his absolute love of the righteous. This is what we have to understand. Mr. Hashem, why is my life so difficult? Yes, Hashem loves you. Hashem loves me. This is going to tell yourself what life is difficult. Hashem loves me. Hashem loves me. Maybe I don't understand. Hashem loves me. Okay, if you don't understand what's happening, what do you do just soul searching? Ask your spiritual guide, ask your rav. Can you make some sense out of this? Help me make sense of that. Often, and don't be embarrassed about asking. The Gemara says that a prisoner can't let himself out of jail. They need somebody else to throw him the key. You know how many times I go to the Melissa Rebbe, my rav, and throw stuff by him? Rebbe, what's happening to me? Rebbe, what's going on? This and that. Can't. <laughs> I can't see myself. I can't be objective myself. That's what we all need. We all need a rabbi and a spiritual guide. And people ask me, uh, how do I pick a rabbi and a spiritual guide? It's the first thing. Ask who his rabbi and spiritual guide is. Because if he doesn't have one, then maybe he thinks he's Moses, and that's not the one you need. Okay, we only have one Moses and, and one King David. We go on to verse 6. We're in Psalm 11, verse 6. Yam ter arishem pachim. Now, the evil ones, they ate in the fancy restaurant. Now comes the bill. The bill is in verse 6. And King David says, Hashem will pour hot coals on the wicked. Fire, brimstone, and scorching winds is the portion in their cup. Oh, you want that demitasse cup of coffee for dessert? No. That the evil person, for his dessert, at the end of his life, he gets fire, brimstone, and scorching winds. Scorching winds are winds that are so hot and so dry that they right away, they leave nothing in the flesh. They leave just dry bone. We're talking about winds in the netherworld. Ooh, that's, okay. This is uh, paying the bills. Okay, and why is all this happening? We learn in verse seven, the completing verse of, of Psalms 11, Here's the good news. Righteous, righteous folks, righteous brothers and sisters. For Hashem is righteous and he loves righteousness. It means when you're righteous, you're one of Hashem's kids. You got your daddy's DNA. Hashem is righteous and he loves righteousness. The upright shall bask in his countenance. No greater gift on earth. And in this world and in the next world. And the next world, for the limits of our spiritual awareness, what we can handle, Hashem will not reveal us a thousand watts of his light if we've only got a soul that can handle 150 watts, because Hashem won't burn us. Okay, Hashem gives us, but the more we strengthen ourselves in Amunah, the more we strengthen ourselves in Torah, the more we strengthen ourselves in mitzvah observance, the more we become vessels of increased divine light. Now, here's an explanation of the tribulations. Why did King David finalize Psalm 11 with that verse. When Hashem gives us tribulations, uh, okay, the Gemara compares a human being to a ceramic pot. You could, if a metal pot gets contaminated with impurity, you can kosher it. You can purify it. You can't purify ceramics. Ground. The only way to purify ceramics is to break it and then put it back in the kiln and burn it. So what Hashem does, he breaks us, quote unquote, and then puts us back in the kiln and refires us. But now we become out better, stronger, and bigger vessels. We come out of the kiln, Hashem's kiln of K-I-L-N, Hashem's kiln of uh, tribulations. We come out stronger. We come out bigger and stronger. Okay, we go on to verse 12. Uh, verse 12, uh, the, the, going down the road, but you could spend this, so much time with this. This is You could just see... Well, when you say Psalms with all your heart, you know what you're saying. And this is the whole purpose that it's Hashem, pray to Hashem and pray to be able to complete this project and have our, our book of Psalms in spoken English. 
that we can all relate to. So now in Psalm 12, this conductor on the eight string lyre, this is how King David wants the conductor to sing it. So it says in verse two, Hoshi Hashem ki gamal chasid ki pasu emonim ibn adam. Hashem, help for the righteous person has become extinct. King David is saying, the righteous person has become extinct. Uh, what? what? What's happened? They're all, they're all disappearing. Why? Because faithfulness has disappeared from humanity. But faithfulness disappeared from humanity. How can that be? That there's no more faithfulness in humanity. The people are just not faithful anymore. And then in verse 3, King, uh, King David says, Okay. Uh, if there's uh, if there's technical difficulties, let's just maybe in it could be one of two things. It's either wartime internet connection over here, or it is the evil inclination doesn't like what we're saying. Okay, doesn't like it, but so may, maybe a little bit of both. Okay, so I ask, ask for forgiveness is something that's not in, not in our power. It's all up to Shem. See everything it depends on Shem. Thank you, Hashem. Thank you, Hashem. Uh, but they try and distract our thoughts. I'm not going to help. We're back in the ball game. Okay, so in verse three, King David says, "Shav yadabu ishet reu sfat chalakot belei velei yadabiru." People lie to each other. This sounds familiar with smooth talk on their lips and deceit in their hearts. Does that now sound like modern society? Huh? The way people have smooth talk on their lips. Why did you come over for coffee? No, tell me. You want me to come over for coffee? Okay, tell me. I want you to come to my house tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Why don't you come? How are you? They don't care how you are. All the smooth talk and the smooth Western society, especially with no one, it's all, it's all deceit. King David's telling us right here. You can see, if you well, where's it all come from? You can see King David is telling us uh, 2,400 years ago where it comes from. Okay, so in verse four, he says, Hashem kol halakot golot May Hashem sever the smooth talking lips and the arrogant tongues. King David said, Hashem uproot them like weeds in the garden. Five, now he's back to saying what they like the way the way King David told us in Psalm 10. How do they talk? They say that they can raise their voices and say whatever they want to do because nobody can tell them what to do. What do you say to people that don't want to listen to Shem? Nobody can tell me what to do. How do you how many times do you hear people like that? No, nobody tells them what to do. And then, okay, Hashem tells him, you can send a little one cell bacteria called Escherichia coli and get into the guy's, uh, and get into the guy's intestines or a little one cell bacteria, uh, pneumonia, pneumonia bacteria, and get into the guy's lungs. Oh, you can't tell that one cell bacteria what to do. You can tell Hashem what to do. But this is what people, this is the arrogant people. In verse six, Mishod Ani'im ben Katev Yonim, Ata Akum Yomar Hashem, Ashit. He says, because of the plundered poor, plundered poor and the cry of the destitute. Now I shall arise, says Hashem. Okay, Hashem says now he's going to stop his concealment. In other words, he's heard the cry of the destitute. He's heard the wailing of the poor. They crawled out to him, Hashem, I have nobody to turn to. By the way, this is a very powerful prayer. The moment a person says to Hashem, Hashem, I have no one to turn to. And not the doctor, not the lawyer. No family, nobody could help me, only you. Hashem, I have no one to turn to. Tell Hashem that a dozen times. Hashem, I have no one to turn to. That is such a powerful prayer and invokes Hashem. Hashem, I'm not going to leave you. Hashem promised he's not going to neglect any one of us. Hashem, if an evil person decides to do a 180 and turns to Hashem like that, Hashem won't ignore him. All the more so when a righteous person does that. Okay. Imot Hashem, imot Kesef tzaruf balir le'eres bezukak shiva time. In verse 7, Hashem's words are like purified silver, apparent to the world, refined seven times over. This is Hashem's words, what King David is giving us right now. In verse 8, Ata Hashem tishmerem tisrenu min ador zu le'olam. You will guard the destitute, Hashem. King David knows the score. Hashem protect them from such a generation forever. You know, he's talking about this generation right now. Look how many, how many people do you know that are Amuna people, real Amuna people? 
And how many non-Amuna people, the politically correct people and the evil people, and uh, I know you heard something crazy in America, this political correctness. They interviewed youth between the ages of 18 and 25 and on mostly college campus people that they, they, they said 60% of them that the land of Israel should be given to Hamas. And you see these things where uh, the, the gays and the LSBTs for, for, for Hamas. Oh, yeah, come on. You're welcome. You're welcome. You love Hamas so much. Come over to Gaza and see what they do to people like you. <laughs> it's it's crazy. It's crazy that where truth is out the window, heaven forbid, Torah, they don't hear about Torah. Nobody's tell them what to do. And all this political correctness is nothing more than lies. Nothing more than lies. So in the final verse in in Psalm 12, King David says, Where is the where the wicked walk on all sides and mankind extols vulgarity? This is just what's happening today. Welcome to the evening news and verse 9 and Psalm 12. All right, now hold it. Don't be the King David said, Well, wait a second. King David's coming right in the game, taking a little break, and I'm gonna say this is Psalm 13. We're not going to conclude tonight on Psalm 12. We're going to conclude on Psalm 13. In Psalm 13, King David says, going to sing another song. For the conductor, David's song of praise. Hashem, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your confidence from me? How long will you hide your me? When I see the evil prevailing, it means you're hiding from me. In verse 3, Hashem, how long must I seek all sorts of ploys to rid myself of the grief that penetrates my heart every day? I've got all these suffering, all the people chasing, pursued by the right, pursued by the left, pursued by my enemies over the border, pursued by enemies within the border, pursued by my own cabinet members, my, my own family, Come on, Hashem. I get nobody to turn to. Okay, well, how long is this going to be? And every day I wake up, I have to look for something to, to pull myself out of depression. I can't be a depression because depression means that I don't like the way you run the world, but I know you run the world for the best, but I don't see you for the moment, Hashem. So I have to find all types of ploys to encourage myself. That's what King David is saying. How long will my enemy prevail over me? Hashem, how long are you going to let him win the ball game? Well, what's going on here? Okay, so in verse 4, he says, Habita aneni Hashem, elokai ha'ilai nai, pani shalomavis. Now the tears are coming down. Now the tears are coming down. Be aware of me and answer my prayer, Hashem. <laughs> He's calling out, I get nobody to talk to, nobody to turn to, nobody to call, only you, Hashem. Be aware of me, Hashem. I'm here, this is David, this is your son. This is Laser. this is Moshe, this is Avram, I'm here right here. This is Sarah, this is Rivka, I'm your daughter. Hashem, come on, listen to me. Just remember what we told before, that Hashem's concealment was so that we would come to this fervent call from the heart. Not from the mouth. Hashem wants from the heart. Now this is our nuclear power. This is our weapon. We're calling Hashem from the heart. This is Psalm 13 in verse 4. Where we ask Hashem, Hashem, I'm here. I'm your son. Hashem, what parent is going to ignore their child? The child's in the war. The child's in the middle of the highway. He's about to be run over by a truck. Oh, parent, I don't see. No, you can't do that, Hashem. I'm your only son. I'm your only daughter. And this is King David is crying out desperately, Hashem, my God, illuminate my eyes so I don't fall into the sleep of death. What do you mean fall into the sleep of death? He says, Hashem, if I don't see you, I'm, that's it, I'm finished. I'm down. And I'm gonna, my eyes, when they close, they're going to close it. And they're going to finish. That's it. Down for the 10 count. That means that it's from here to the graveyard. Hashem, don't let that happen because I'm on the way to get killed. This is it. This is, you know, and, and, and you know, <laughs> Somebody knows if you've ever been a chance, or ever been in a situation, you ever been in a crossfire, you've ever been in a dangerous situation, you ever been in a in a place where you, you didn't know if you're gonna cure, you never know. Maybe you've been in a place where your life expectancy is another minute. This is what you talk to Hashem. This is it. This is the real deal. And anybody that's been through that, that, that there's an Israeli soldiers that are learning this right now. And that's why they're all walking with non-religious soldiers. They're all walking with books of Psalms in their, in their ammo jacket. 
and they were in tzitzis. They might not even have a keep on their head. But they, they're all saying these psalms. They're, they see them they're, they're from the time I spend with soldiers. They say, Rabbi, you got another book of songs? You got another tzitzis? This is crazy what is going on here in the grassroots. And I'm talking about upper, upper, upper echelons. Hashem should awaken them. And the politicians are still sleeping. But then in the, on the grassroots, in the army, and the citizenry, I've never seen. And I've been in Israel since I was 21. That's a, in 1970. And we're talking about 53 years. And even it, it, it wars, how many wars have we went through? I've never seen such spiritual awakenings. What's happening right now? This is right here. Psalm 13, verse 4. Say it from the bottom of your heart. And you're going to pierce the skies. And in verse 5, but it says, okay, Hashem, if you don't listen to me, or else my enemy will boast that he's overcome me and my tormentors rejoice in my collapse. Hashem, you know what it means when me, the king of Israel, King David is saying, Mashiach, when I collapse, that means they're all going to boast that they beat you. They beat you, whatever does it mean? Where do I get my power from? I don't have power, it's all from you. Hashem, you can't let that happen. But now King David comes back and he girds himself with strength and he concludes Psalm 13 with verse 6. We sing this, but as for me, I will trust in your loving kindness, Hashem. My heart will rejoice in your salvation. It's coming. I know it's coming. The reinforcements are on the way. I've got no doubt about it. The salvation is on the way. I will sing to Hashem for he has dealt bountifully with me. In other words, King David starts singing to Hashem before the, 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 the reinforcements come in, before the salvation comes, he starts singing to Hashem. Oh, you know what Hashem? Hashem doesn't mean beholden. You thank Hashem when you're in the deep, the trouble. You thank Hashem when, when everything is in, in the worst possible situation. Wow, and wait and see the blessings you'll get. So don't ever forget that. Include your prayers with verse 6 of chapter 13, and you say these prayers when you're in trouble, Psalms 10, 11, 12, and 13, and it's going to be a short while until you see salvation. Amen. God bless. <laughs>